Okay, but real quick on the on the boundary survey maps, this just came up on something Hunter and I were working on today. So let's say we've got a situation like this. We've got a parcel, and we've got either some parcel lines or tie lines coming in on the bottom. Okay, and there's a couple monuments here. Okay, so as a general rule, we want to label all three of these A, B, and C. Okay, so <clears throat> something like this is what I call an orphan segment. Right, it doesn't have a label. Right, as a general rule, and you'll see that on maps sometimes, but we don't we don't do that as a general rule. If we've got a segment on here like that, we'll we'll show it, and then whenever we can, if if the map's not too cluttered, we'll show the overall. Right, we're trying to just prevent people from having to do the math. Um, that's just a that's just a good habit. So if you bring me stuff, one of the things I do when I'm checking your maps is I'm looking for orphan segments like this. So I just wanted to, I don't know that we'd ever talked about that, so I wanted to. Now, I've seen it done a lot of times, mostly just to, prov to pro provide space, real estate, on the map. Yeah, I mean, we. I'm not going to say I wouldn't ever let it happen, but just kind of as a rule of thumb, you know, we try not to make people do the math. Uh, actually, a better way to do this would be to put D on top and ABC down below, because then your overall is not crossing these lines, right? That's actually the way we would do it. Yeah. Okay, so let's talk about. Hunter said, "Hey, what's all these? What's all the mumbo jumbo that comes up when I try and reproject data in QGIS?" So, when we're when we're running into that most frequently is when we've got a, a USDA and eight ortho that we've cut out. The default projection for that is UTM zone ten. Okay, so just so you guys know, UTM is Universal Transverse Mercator, and it is a map projection that covers the whole globe. So you take the globe and it's split up into zones. I don't know how many there are, I don't remember. But we are in zone 10. Okay, and then they take the equator, they split each slice of the earth gets split north south of the equator. So we're in UTM zone 10 north. Okay, so that's what you see in QGIS when you're reprojecting um, a USDA USDA NAEP ortho, UTM zone 10 north. <clears throat> okay. It's a metric system. So it's gonna be in meters. Almost, almost always when you're in universal transverse mercator, you're in, you're in uh, meters. So just so you guys know, <clears throat> transverse mercator is a cylinder. It's just a cylinder they drop over the earth, okay? Transverse means up and down. I can't remember, is it up and down or sideways? It might be sideways. The cylinder might be sideways. Um, and uh, I can't remember what mercator means, but... Anyways, uh, mercator was the guy that made that. Maybe Mer the mercator made the projection. Yeah. So anyways, it's just a cylinder that they use for map projection. And uh, it splits the earth up into however many zones north and south of the equator. Okay, so USDA, for some unknown reason to me, they do their imagery on UTM zone 10 metric. Okay, and there's a lot of other data sets that are on UTM because it's, it's probably the most commonly used map projection around the world is UTM zone 10, or is UTM metric. Okay, so <clears throat> what you see when you, when you go into QGIS and you go to reproject, and I can't remember, so I think in QG, QGIS, if you set your project to state plane, let's say California state plane zone three, and then you go to import your photo, it's gonna say QGIS is built to say, hey, whoa, these aren't the same. How do you want me to get from one to the other? Okay, and it gives you some options. There's like two or three options, okay? And so here's what it's trying to figure out. <clears throat> So, UTM zone 10 is a projection. Okay, so um, uh, it's a projection. So we're taking latitude, longitudes on the earth and we're projecting, projecting it onto a surface that can be flattened. That's what a projection is. Okay. But, so I want you guys to understand, you could have a universal transverse mercator projection that uses different datums. Okay, so diff different ellipsoids. Okay, so an ellipsoid is just a mathematical model of the Earth's surface. Okay, and there's different kinds of ellipsoids. So GRS-80 is an ellipsoid. Okay, so typically when you're working with GIS data, you need both. You need an ellipsoid definition and you need a UT and you need a projection. Okay, so this is an ellipsoid, this is a map projection. 
And now I don't know, I'd have to look, we could Google it, but UTM zone 10 may have an assigned ellipsoid or you may have to, you may be able to use UTM zone, uh, universe trans transverse mercator with different kinds of ellipsoids, I don't know. Uh, Hunter, can you grab your phone real quick? Just Google uh, ellipsoid used for UTM and what does it tell you? Let's see what it says. Is there a specific ellipsoid? Yeah, the World Geodetic System ellipsoid is now generally used to model the Earth and the UTM coordinate system. So uh, WGS84. Okay, all right. So <clears throat> what Hunter's telling us is typically UTM is using WGS the WGS84 ellipsoid, which if I remember correct is the GRS80 ellipsoid, which by the way is the same ellipsoid that's used for state plane coordinates, okay? All right, but <clears throat> so I want you guys I don't want to get super lost in the weeds here, but I want you to understand. Depending on the ellipsoid you use, your latitude and longitude values for the same point are going to change. Okay, so take the corner of this table, right? The latitude longitude value for this point in one ellipsoid is going to be different, slightly different from the latitude longitude in a different in a different uh, a different uh, ellipsoid and horizontal datum. So, for example, WGS84. Is, an, is the GRS-80 ellipsoid best fit to the Earth. NAD-83 is the GRS-80 ellipsoid best fit to the North American plate, and they're about three feet apart. Okay, so you're gonna get a latitude longitude value that's three feet apart, depending on your, on your datum that you use. Okay, so just to, let me try and explain that a little bit differently. If you took a latitude longitude in NAD-83 and, and projected a state plane coordinate with it, zone three, and then you did the same thing with WGS84, you're going to get two state plane coordinates that are about three feet apart, and you can actually see that in Trimble Business Center. Okay, you can see the difference in those two. Okay, so your ellipsoid and your datum are, are very important, right? They're going to change your coordinate values. Okay, so ellipsoid and the datum. Okay, so when I say a, a horizontal datum, okay, that's when you take the ellipsoid and you anchor it to some some point on the earth. Okay, so an ellipsoid definition is just how fat is the earth and how tall is it? That's all it is. It's those two numbers. That's what defines an ellipsoid. Okay, then once you have that basic shape of the ellipsoid, it's like, where do you put it on the earth? So NAD 83 fixes it to the North American plate, tectonic plate. WGS 84 fixes it to the center of the earth's mass. Okay, and they're three feet apart. All right, so... <clears throat> What QGIS is doing when it sees that your image is in UTM zone 10, okay, there's another part to this. I'm running out of colors. <laughs> okay. The other part to this is you got to have some kind of unit, <laughs> distance unit. Okay, so in UTM zone 10, what's our distance unit? Distance unit. That's in meters, right? Yeah, meters. Okay, so now QGIS knows you want to go from that. So this is UTM zone 10 on this side. And it knows that you want to get over here to state plane coordinate, California state plane coordinate zone three. Okay, so it's gotta, it's gotta do two or three or four different things to make that transformation. So the first thing it says is how do I get, are my ellipsoids the same? Are my ellipsoids the same? That's the first thing it wants to ask. If the ellipsoids aren't the same, it's gotta transfer it's got to figure out how to convert from one ellipsoid to another, okay? And there's a way to do that. It's a seven-parameter transformation. It's called the Helmert. I think it's called the Helmert transformation. We won't get into the details today, but, okay? So it wants to know, do I got to change ellipsoids? Okay, now in this case, I told you, state plane coordinates uses the same, it looks like it uses the same ellipsoid as uh, UTM zone 10. So does QGIS have to change ellipsoids? No. No, same ellipsoids. Okay, same same ellipsoid. Okay, now the next thing it needs to know is are my horizontal datum the same? Horizontal datum. Okay. Are my horizontal datums the same? Okay, now, what's the horizontal datum over here? WGS84. WGS84. What's the horizontal datum for 
California State Plains Zone 3. So the 83, right? Nat 83, by definition. Okay, so are the are the datums of this the horizontal datums the same? No. Okay, so it is gonna have to change latitude, longitude, ellipsoid height values to get from actually it's just latitude, longitude, to get from WG S84 to NAT 83. You remember I told you if you don't do that, if you don't do that correctly, how far off are your points gonna be from WG S84 to NAT 83? Three About three feet. Okay, so QGS is, is smart enough to know that. It says, hey, I gotta do a transformation to get from WGS84 to NAT83, okay? So that's step one. Okay, the next thing it needs to do is it needs to, it needs to know, are, am I on the same projection? Are the projections the same? Okay, now I didn't tell you yet, but State Plane uses what they call a Lambert, a Lambert Conic Conformal. Okay, it's just a cone. This is a cone, this is a cylinder at UTM. Okay, so this is a transverse Mercator projection. This is Lambert conic conformal. Okay, it's a cone. So are the projections the same? No. No. So after it changes the latitude longitude values from WGS84 to GRS80, what's the next thing it's got to do? Then it's got to do the projection. It's got to do change the projection. Okay. Okay, and then it's got there's one more step. Okay, what's my distance unit on California State Plane 3, the way we use it? Is it meters? U.S. survey feet. U.S. foot, that's how we use it. Okay, so after it's changed the projection, then it's gotta do what? It's gotta convert from meters to feet. Okay, so let me just write in purple, because I like all my colors. We're gonna just go through the math that QGIS has to do to make this transformation. Okay, so here's, the, here's what it does. The first thing it does is it takes the UTM coordinates. I feel like such a doof sometimes. <laughs> okay, it takes the very first step is to take the UTM coordinate, okay? And it translates it, it translates it back to latitude longitude. So it unprojects. It goes from grid back to latitude longitude. It's unprojecting the data. Okay, now it's got a latitude longitude. But what kind of latitude longitude is it? WGS84. WGS84. So now it's got to convert from latitude longitude in WGS84 to latitude longitude on NAT83. Okay. Okay, that's the second step. Okay, now, now it goes from latitude, longitude, and nat 83, and it converts those, it projects them with the new projection into a uh, grid, we'll call this grid. Okay, this is grid UTM. This is grid, California State Plane Coordinate, okay? Grid means a northing and easting, right? Not a latitude and longitude, okay? But what distance unit is this in by default? Meters. Meters. So the last step is it has to scale from meters to feet, okay? Not scale. S scale, yes. Scales, yeah, scale. scales the northings and eastings, just like we do in CAD, okay? So how many steps to get from UTM zone 10 to... California State Plains, Zone 3, Nat 83, four, four steps. Okay, now, I don't expect you to, obviously we don't have to, I don't want you guys, you don't need to memorize this for all the projections we work with, but you should understand the basic concepts here, right, of how we get from grid coordinates in one projection to grid coordinates in another and with a different data. Now, when QGIS pops up a little warning box, here's what it's typically telling you. This, this step right here where we go from one datum to another is not super exact. It's just hard to do uh, horizontal translations from, from one datum to another. It's just hard, it's, it's not exact. Yeah, for, okay. for Homer you need, uh, since it's seven parameter, you need three points. But yeah, it's just tricky. Yeah. Yeah, it's just, it's a, tr it's a tricky transformation. And so what QGIS is telling you when it pops up the little dialogue is it's saying, hey, this isn't gonna be exact. 
is that okay or not? And then you have to tell it, yeah, it's okay, right? And what it does is it gives you a couple different options. I can't remember, I'd have to go look, but it might be giving you options on the specific ellipsoid or the epic date of the of the horizontal datum. It's letting you choose, like, I think it shows you NRS 2007 yeah, that, and then... That's what my question was really mostly about, because it gives you, like, Harn, three different versions of the Harn and... Yeah. yeah like, uh, Okay, so it's giving you, okay, so this gets more complicated, but NAT83 has different flavors, okay? So you can have NAT83 per the latest NGS Epic. You can have NAT83 per HARN. HARN is the High Accuracy Reference Network. That is a California okay. implementation of NAT83 that Caltrain just used to use, okay? So there's all these different flavors, okay? So... <clears throat> How do you know which one to pick? My answer is, it depends on what you're doing. Okay, so worst case scenario, if you weren't sure what the difference was between, say, a Harn Epic, a Harn version of NAT83 and the, the NGS Core's version of, of N80, N8, NAT83, if you weren't sure if it was a big enough difference to matter, how would we test that? If I wasn't here and you wanted to know, how would you test it? You do it both. You do it both times and you see how far apart your northings and eastings are, right? So I always tell people, don't be afraid to just throw some stuff at the wall sometimes. Like, you're not going to break anything, <laughs> okay? So if you're not sure, run it both ways and see what the difference is on a test point, what, what your difference is in northing and easting. Okay, here's what I'm going to tell you. When we're, when we're reprojecting USDA, Nate... Imagery, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what you pick. What's the resolution of that imagery? Does anybody know? It's one meter. One meter, three feet. That means you probably can't tell an object apart. You can't probably identify an object in the imagery if it's if it's smaller than three feet. In other words, usually in that USDA nape, you can't pick out a mantle with. Okay, so the difference between a Harn and uh, NGS cores. Uh, flavor of uh, NAT83 is going to be less than the resolution of the imagery. So it really doesn't matter. Okay. Now I want to give you some rules of thumb because this is really what we're going to talk about next is really, really important. Okay. It's what makes us surveyors and not flunkies. Okay. So let's talk about, I'm going to give you some examples of when we have to care about this and when we don't. Okay. And here, here's what I would give you as a, as a rule of thumb. If you're not sure, do not reproject data in QGIS or any other GIS program. Talk to somebody, okay? Because it will burn you if you're not careful. So let's just look at three or four examples of when it might be okay to reproject data in QGIS and when it's not. And I'm gonna just I'm gonna write the examples up here, and you're gonna tell me what what you guys think, yes or no. Okay. So I'm gonna give you at least three. So first example, we want just a background image so we can draft a quick vicinity map. Okay, can you reproject your data in QGIS for that? Yeah. Yeah, that's okay. You're good there, right? That's totally acceptable. <laughs> and do I care which flavor of NAT83 you pick for that? No. I don't care. Okay, now we want to pull the... <laughs> Do I keep blocking the camera? Sorry. Now we want to pull the approximate. We want to figure out what the approximate area is of the wetlands in the, in a particular parcel, plus or minus the nearest half acre or acre. Can we reproject USDA NAPE photography to do that in yeah. QGIS? Yeah, that's probably okay. So it's 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 more accurate. We, the accuracy needs are higher than a Vic map, but we're still probably within the GIS realm of accuracy. 
Okay, now, we want to know if a structure, oh, by the way, when we get to these two, okay, so this is one data set. How many data sets do we need to figure this out? The area of a wetland on a parcel. Um, yeah. We need two data sets. We need the parcel data and we need the, the photography, right? Okay, now I want to know how many structures roughly are on a parcel. How many data sets? Two. We need the USDA, USDA name and we need the we need the parcel line work. Okay, so is this okay? What do you think? To count the number of structures on a parcel? Are we okay to reproject in QGIS? Just count the number, Just count the number of structures. Yeah. yeah, that's probably okay. Okay? Probably all right there. As long as there's nothing like super close to the line. Okay. Now, well, so you might get some edge cases there, right? Okay, so here's part of being a surveyor. If you get some edge cases where a building crosses the the building and the photography crosses the property line, what do we got to do? Just go survey. I don't. We got to figure it out. We got to talk to somebody. You got to figure out, and you know, you got to ask some more questions. I'm not going to say it's not okay. Maybe it is okay, but we got to understand the use case and what the client's trying to do with the data. That's part of what makes us surveyors is we just don't click buttons in QGIS. We ask questions. And we understand how the client is going to use our data. Okay, now let's look at the ex last example. I want to get a distance of a building to PL to verify setback. Can we use QGIS for that? No. Absolutely not. No way, Jose. We've just exceeded the acceptable use of QGIS to reproject <laughs> data. Okay, so let me just talk about something that's really important. I want you to understand as soon as you get past this line right here, you've got two sources of error. Right? You've got the error in the photography, okay, the ortho photo, and then you've got the error, error in the GIS parcel data. So you've got your answer is going to have the error in both those sources of data. Okay. So the more data sets you've got to integrate to get your answer in GIS, the more potential error you're starting to aggregate. Now that doesn't mean you can't, you know, maybe you've got six or seven or eight different layers in your GIS to get your answer. That's okay. As long as you know where those layers came from, you know relatively how accurate they are, and you make sure that your use case isn't, the accuracy needs of your use case aren't exceeding the accuracy of your data. Okay, now what do I know about how the county, how much do I, Landon Blake, land surveyor, really know about how the count, San Joaquin County put together their GIS parcel layer? How much do I know about that? Yeah. Like, I know I know almost zero about how they do that. So how reliable is that data for us? Almost zero. It's not very. Like we got to be really careful with it, folks. Right now, is it good enough for a Vic map? Yeah. You know, is it good enough if a client wants to know plus or minus the nearest acre, how much wetland might be on a parcel? Is it good enough for that? Yeah, it's probably good enough for that. You know, but I guess what we get down here to one of these two, and I'm going to tell you, man, maybe we start cross-checking that GIS parcel layer against the assessor's map and make sure they look fairly similar, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mr. Stetson? So, for example, I got, I've been uh, LA County, mm -hmm. pulled some GIS data, yeah. and they got imagery, and yep. they got parcel lines, yep. and they've got sewer lines, they got yep. all, everything yeah. on there. Um, but it's all combined. So when you download it, it just downloads as a database file. Yep. And so but how do you figure that out? Okay, so you gotta you gotta be able to get to the metadata. Metadata is data about data. Okay. Okay, so I'm gonna let you in on a dirty little secret about most GIS data. Has it been surveyed? No. It hasn't. So we just gotta be careful with it. Now it's useful for all kinds of stuff. Okay, but one of the problems in the modern world is that GIS people way abuse that data. So I'll give you a perfect example. I fought with the city of Merced for two weeks because they were misusing some FEMA flood GIS data and just had no idea that, that the underlying accuracy of the data set, um, you know, they, they were they were arguing with me over, a, over whether or not a tiny little parcel was in or out of the flood zone and the boundary on the flood map was 200 foot wide at the scale of the map, right? It just was absolutely stupid. Okay, but that's what happens when you get people in local government that don't understand what we're talking about here, right? And I finally told her, I am not the building official. I said, I am not going to argue with, with you about this anymore. I am the licensed surveyor. 
if you don't like my answer, you find me somebody with a license at the city of Merced that's going to tell me I can't do it this way. And she did. She went and got her boss, who was a PE, to tell me that I was going to do it their way. Okay. Did he understand the accuracy of the data he was dealing with? No. No, he didn't either. But at least he had a license. Okay. So it's really important that we understand. I'm glad Hunter asked the question. You know, part of what, what makes us different from a lot of the yahoos running around is we, we understand the accuracy of our data and we know when, we, we've got to know when GIS data sets aren't going to give us a good enough answer. So on the bottom one, you really want to answer that question? What do you got to go do, folks? You got to go measure it. You got to go survey the boundary and buildings. the buildings. You need two survey grade data sets to really answer that question with any degree of confidence, right? I don't know. My GIS goes to like six decimal places. Yeah, that's what people do. Yeah, and it gets them into trouble. Okay, so anyways, that was just, that branched a little bit on what, so what Hunter asked a good question, what I want you guys to, part of the answer is if we're dealing with survey grade data, we got to be really, we got to be really careful reprojecting stuff into GIS. And let me just give you a quick example. Let's just say we had gone out and surveyed some property lines and the client says, Hey, I mean, this is a little bit of a silly example, but the client calls up and says, Hey, um, can we please get your, your, uh, your CAD files in UTM Zone 10 metric, right? So they want to take our survey grade parcel boundaries and convert them to UTM Zone 10 metric, okay? Can, can we do that in QGIS? We probably could. Okay, should we? No. I don't know. I would be very afraid at that point. Okay, my very first freaking question would be, why do you want our survey grade data in UTM Zone 10 metric? Like, I would ask that question, right? Okay, and then if the answer was, well, because our, our inspector wants to run out with his handheld GPS receiver to stake your property corners in the field, like, am I going to do that? No. no. Like that, but you don't know. So, like, part of what I'm trying to tell you guys is if somebody's asking for our survey grade data sets in some funky projection that isn't California State Plain, we need to ask some questions, mm -hmm. right? Like, what are you doing with this? Now, if the answer is, oh... We just want to put your data set into our GIS. I might be willing to have that conversation with the client, right? But we got to be very careful. Okay, so let me ask you this question. Let's say the client has a legitimate reason to get our survey grade data set, whatever it is, into some projection other than State Plain Zone 3. I told you you can't do it in QGIS. How do we do it? You could do it with TBC, right? I would rather do it with TBC. Yes, so you can do that in TBC. It's a little scary. So here's what I want you to remember. Whenever surveyors aren't sure about how they're moving stuff around in coordinate space, we, we have a fail-safe way to check our work. Okay? I mean, I bet Danny knows what it is. What's the fail-safe way to go check our work? You go measure stuff on the ground. That's always our fail-safe. Okay, so let me give you an example. Let's say we've gone out and we've surveyed these three property corners, these four property corners, on State Plain, State Plain, Zone 3, U.S. survey feet. And we know this is 150 feet by 100 feet. Okay. And the client says, hey, can we get that in UTM Zone 10? Sure, we can do that. Okay, so we're going to project that in TVC. In theory, you could do this with QGIS too. I don't think you're going to get as good of an answer, but we project this in TVC, and we come up with we come up with UTM zone, UTM zone ten metric coordinates on each one of these corners. UTM, 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 UTM. All right. So here's the first thing I would do. The first thing I would do is I would go take those coordinates in CAD before I even went out to the ground, I'd take those coordinates in CAD and I would just inverse them. And what should I get? In metric, I should get these values, right? Now my guess is if you actually went through this exercise, are, are you gonna get, uh, Hunter, real, real quick, take 150 divided by 3.28083. Three. 3.28083, that's gonna be close. 
45, 72. You just knew that conversion off the top of your head, huh? It's 3.2808333 is the conversion from US survey feet to metric. Okay, so that's the answer we should get in meters if this worked perfectly. Now, when we do the conversion and we draw a line and cab between these two points and we click on the properties dialog and look at the distance, my guess is we're probably not going to get this. We're going to get something like this. It's going to be slightly off. So what I want to know is, what's the question we always ask as surveyor about this difference? What's the actual difference in it? Is that an acceptable level of slop given what, how the data is being used? That's always the question we answer. Or, or, or the, yeah, the question that we want to answer. So that's about a centimeter. How, how much is a centimeter? Half an inch. Centimeter is about a half an inch, yeah. Okay, so for most stuff we do, is this okay? Yeah. Yeah, that's probably okay, right? Okay, so that's before we even go in the field. Okay, but here's what I would do if I was the surveyor. So we had a couple control points that we used to survey these four property corners, right? And the way we work here, we have latitude, longitude values on these, right? And I already told you that UTM uses the same horizontal datum as, um, no, it doesn't, it's slightly different, right? It's a WGS84 and NAT83. So what I would do is I would go survey these. We would go survey these two control points. Okay, and we'd figure out what is their latitude, longitude, height. So we're going to go survey it on UTM and come up with these values. We're going to take those values, we're going to unproject them back to latitude, longitude, heights. We're going to run them back through the datum conversion from NAT83 to WGS84, and I want to see how close I get. Okay, and we can do that in TBC. I can teach you guys how to do that, right? Okay, now we don't hardly, I, I, I don't can't remember the last time I've, I've been asked by a client for something in a funky coordinate system. What I'm saying is there's always a way to check that on the ground, right? So worst case scenario, if we're doing some kind of funky reprojection with our data and it needs to be survey grade, what do we always have to do at the end of the day? Do we trust the software? No. How do we check it? Physically check it? You go out and measure it on the ground. Right? That's, that's what we do. We ask ourselves, how's the data being used? And we want, we want to go out and measure it on the ground. And even before we go out and measure it on the ground, what I just taught you guys is, you, what can you compare besides just coordinate values? Before you even go out on the ground, what can you look at? Distances. Distances between coordinates, right? Just get an idea. You know, when I reprojected from system A to system B, how did my distances change? Now, depending on how far your distances are and what projection you're using and where you're at, they could change a lot. Okay, but we have the ability to answer that question. Okay, so let me tell you the difference between Cameron Manon and Elena Placencia and Hunter Stetson and everybody else that has QGIS. Does anybody else even stop to ask the freaking question? No. no, they just hit the button. Okay, what makes us surveyors? We don't just hit the button without asking the questions, right? How, what's the error in my inputs? What's the error in my output? Is this good enough for the use case? How do I, how do I prove that to myself? That is why we get paid the big bucks, okay? Danny, you got anything to add? No. I'm gonna tell you a story about a surveyor. It was a lady surveyor that saved my bacon one day. I had a job that we did and there was a little toggle, it was Civil 3D, AutoCAD Civil 3D had just come out and there was a stupid toggle. Some brilliant programmer at Autodesk thought it would be great to have the default coordinate system in international feet. Okay, and I, I did a topo and we designed plans on international feet. And the difference between state plane on survey feet and state plane on international feet was about 13 feet where I was working. Now, the lady that got hired to stake this job went out and tied in some of her own control and shot curves and realized that her curves were 13 feet off my curves in the topo for the plan set. And she called me and she said, hey, something doesn't look right. Can you take a look at this 
for me. And I went and looked at it for about 15 minutes and realized what we did. And I called her back and I said, man, I am so embarrassed. I said, yep, I screwed up. This project's an international feat. She said, no problem. Now that I know that, I'll, I'll make sure that I use your control and we'll, we'll, we'll build everything in relation to the control where it's supposed to be. Because you guys understand, she could basically take that whole project and move it 13 feet globally and get it where, where it needed to be, right? Okay, but here's the whole point of the story. She didn't just take some coordinate values off a set of plans and start wheeling and dealing. What did she do? She went and checked some hard stuff on the ground. And she's like, something doesn't look right. Okay, that's a good surveyor right there. Right? She could have, if, 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 if she wasn't careful, she could have gone and put my water line 13 feet in the wrong spot. Okay? But she didn't. She double checked. Right? And so Dan, Danny knows because he's been a construction surveyor forever. You just start, you just run out and tag a couple points on the control and start throwing wood in the ground, Danny? Nope. You check your conforms. Yep. You check, your, you check something physical besides just your control to make sure you're not having those problems. So. All right, there was one other thing I wanted to talk about besides, I can't remember what it was. We we're going to talk about projections, and then I said there was one other thing that I wanted to talk about. Does anybody have teams up? Can they look? So I feel like I rambled a little bit. I need to, I need to make that a little more concise and just get you guys like a little cheat sheet, like GIS reprojection cheat sheet. What are the questions we need to ask? Just a time for CAD meeting upstairs. Yeah, no, before that, in that same thread. There was one other quick thing I wanted to cover. Uh, PRC, PRC requirements. Oh, yeah, okay, real quick. <clears throat> Does anybody know what the PRC is? You said it this morning. California Public Resources Code. So it's the California state law that governs public resources. Okay, and for some reason unknown to me, that is where they stuck the rules for state plane coordinates in California. It's in the Public Resources Code, Section 8801. I have a copy I have assembled for you in, as a Word document, and I will PDF it and send it to you guys so you have the code. Okay, so the PRC code is where the zone constants are defined. So for, the, for our seven, six or seven zones, I can't remember, it tells you which counties are in which zone, what the central, what the... Uh, what the longitude of the central meridian is and what the latitudes are of the standard parallels in each state plane zone. It's defined in the Public Resources Code. Okay, There is also a set of rules in the Public Resources Code that surveyors have to follow if they're going to use state plane coordinates on a survey grade product. Okay, So I just want to, I'm just going to briefly introduce this topic to you guys. Okay, Here's what I want you to know about state plane coordinates. This came up on Market Street. So in theory, anytime we use state plane coordinates on a map, we are supposed to provide this information on the map. And we do a pretty good job of this here. But you got to tell people what zone you're in. Okay. Now that's only the projection, right? This gets back to what we just learned. That's just the projection. And a projection is an important part. But, they, but we need to tell people at least two more things about our coordinates. It's not just the projection. What else do they need to know? Scale. Okay, that's coming up. They need to know the horizontal datum. Does that make a difference in the coordinates? What did I tell you guys? What's the difference between WGS84 and NAD83? Three feet. Okay, so do you need to know the horizontal datum that was used to get in the right spot? Well, I mean, shouldn't yes. it be all the same if it's for California State Plane? California State Plane is just the projection. That does not define the horizontal oh. datum that you used. Right? So you got to say the datum. And not only should you say the datum, NAT 83, you should say the flavor of the datum. NAT 83 per what? Per HARN? Per NGS cores? If it's NGS cores, which epic date is it? Is it 2010 epic date? Is it an old? Is it 1991.35 epic date? Okay, so you need to give them the horizontal datum and what I call the flavor. Right? What's the flavor? So it's not enough to just tell people I'm having ice cream. What do they want to know? What kind of ice cream are you having? Okay, so you got to tell them that. Okay, then the other thing we talked about. What else do you got to tell them? Got 
Gotta tell them your distance unit. Right? By the way, what's the default distance unit in state plane coordinates? It's meters. It's meters. So if you're in US survey feet, do you gotta tell somebody? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. You gotta tell them. Okay? It's also important because what else is floating around out there besides US survey feet? Uh, international feet. US international, yeah, international feet. So you gotta tell them what's your distance unit. Okay? Okay, now here's there's two or three other things you gotta tell them by a law. This is in the public resources Wait, code. Real quick. Speaking, so they're getting rid of U.S. survey feet, yeah. so is that... We're getting all new datums, I mean, okay. all new projections, so it's all going to change. Okay. okay, so Danny gave us one. we got to tell them the combined scale factor, right, by law, okay? Now, that's usually the only thing surveyors will give you. They usually don't even give you this stuff. They just say, uh, they just give you the scale factor. They say, we're in grade, here's the scale factor, okay? But that's actually illegal according to the public resources code, okay? So they also need to tell you the scale point. What point did they scale from? Okay, and I don't think it says this directly in the law, but I think it's implied that you need to give them the northing easting for the scale point, okay? And the elevation of the scale point, because that is partly what determines your scale factor. Elevation of the scale point, okay? And there's one more thing you gotta give, the mapping angle. Okay, that mapping angle tells you how you get from grid north, grid bearings to ground bearings. Those are the seven things. Every time we use state plane coordinates, we have to put those seven things on the map or I am violating the public resources code. Okay, any kind of work product. We're pretty good about this. We're way, way better than most other firms. We do most of them. We almost always, our standard maps have these notes in them already. Okay, now, in our shop, where can you go to get all of this information for any given job? Should be in our boundary notes, right? Nope. Oh. Danny, you want to try? TBC. TBC. All this information can typically be, take, be taken out of the TBC project. <clears throat> okay, it should be, usually you want to go to the network project, not the working. The network project, because the working project has been scaled up to ground. Okay, TBC. Okay, and then... <clears throat> It's not going to, you know what, we don't do this, but we should. We should We should start putting this information in the text file for people that don't use TBC. But the, these four pieces of information, we always put in the CSF report. It should be in the network export folder, always should have that information. Okay, and what we need to do is we need to start just putting this at the top of that file for you guys. So that way non-TBC users can get that information when they need it. Okay, yes, Mr. Stetson. What, what? I think I'm just misunderstanding what you're trying to say with seven. What is seven? Oh, like, mapping angle. What, Sorry, the mapping an angle. It's in the yeah. Mm -hmm. so I think I, I think I probably know it. It's just I'm not That's okay. picking it up right So now. here's the state plane coordinate cone for zone three. Right. Here's the central meridian. Let's say our project area is right here. Uh -huh. Okay, this angle right here is the difference between grid north. This is true oh. north. Okay. Okay, yeah. this is grid north. That's the mapping angle right here, right? As you go east and west away from the central meridian, yeah. your mapping angle gets it's larger. That's what we show in our control diagrams, right? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so that's in the law, California Public Resources Code. Okay, so if we're in grid, it doesn't matter what the work product is, that information's got to be on it. Okay, so if it's a plat and legal and we're in grid like we are on Market Street, all that information has to get on the plat or the legal, one of the two. Okay? That's the law. Most surveyors don't know that. But it's there. So I'm going to print you guys out the public resources code. You can highlight it, tab it, keep it with you. Okay? And then I'll try and work up a little cheat sheet. You know, what do we need to ask before we reproject data using GIS software? Okay? 90% of the time it's fine. You guys are okay. But anytime we have survey grade data, we want to be really careful. When we're, especially if it's the client asking us, we want to know what the heck are they doing. Okay, and I'll just give you a quick example of why that's important. So up at um, up at, at Willsieville, the client asked me for the CAD file of our boundary. We did a tat, uh, we did a land title survey, and the client called and said, "Can we get the CAD file for your boundary?" And I said, "I might be willing to do that. What do you want it? Why do, why do you need it?" And he said, "Well, our designer wants to use it to lay out the the structures for the power plant." I said, okay, that's great, except I don't know how your designer is going to do that because I didn't do a topo survey, and I didn't see anybody else's control on site. So how are you going to tie my boundary down 
to your topo survey for the design. And they said, well, our guy just grabbed some contours off of Google Earth. I said, not going to send you my CAD file for the boundary. Like, if you really want to know where that, where that parcel boundary is in relation to your design, you need to pay us to do a topo survey. So that's just an example of, you know, it, 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 that'd be like if the client said, hey, can we get your parcel boundary as a KMZ file? Like, ask questions. Like, what, what are you doing and why do you want it in a Google Earth file? Well, because he's doing the design on Google Earth, right? So most of the time, most of the time, if the client wants to, to be able to really rely on that information to make good location decisions, we need to be doing some kind of survey on the ground to enable that, right? Like, and do people, I, I actually went to a public hearing one time to get the Monument Preservation Fund approved in San Joaquin County, and I testified, I don't know if you call it testified, but I gave a public statement in front of the County Board of Supervisors, and one of the County Board of Supervisors said, I don't understand why we need property corner monuments anymore. I can see my parcel boundaries on Google Maps. That's why they take it off of Google Maps. Okay, but you see, like, that is the level of ignorance that we deal with on a daily basis, right? So when somebody's asking for our data in an easy-to-consume GIS format, we have to be very careful. I'm not saying that we won't provide it for clients, but we need to know how they're using it, right? And we probably need to be getting some kind of release of liability signed. Because if you really want to know where crap is at on the ground, what do you got to pay for? Okay. A, survey. a survey. Yeah, you got to pay for a survey. What was your answer to... Wilseyville? No. Oh, to, that... to the County Board of Supervisor? I tried to explain to them that that data was approximate and that the monuments on the ground really controlled the location. They approved the fund. We got it approved. But it's just it's a great story because it goes it just goes to show like that that was a guy on our county board of supervisors. Right? And like he had no freaking clue. So um, what's part of our job as land surveyors is to keep GIS professionals and civil engineers from screwing stuff up together. Right? My boss always used to tell me when the, when the GIS world meets the design world, somebody realizes they should have called a land surveyor. That's part of what we do here. Because like, if we let those two groups of folks, GIS folks and civil engineers, get together, the world would be crooked everywhere you looked. <laughs> okay? So part of that is us understanding how those two worlds have to work together. Right? Okay? So I'm glad Hunter asked the question. Like, I'm, like he irritates me almost every day. <laughs> But he asked a really intelligent question, right? Like, hey, I'm pushing this button in QGIS, and it's giving me all these weird options. What am I doing? Good question. Now you know what you're doing. It's trying to reproject from UTM Zone 10 to California State Plain Zone 3, and there's several different ways to do that, depending on the horizontal datum you pick. Most of the time, for what we're doing with that imagery, it doesn't matter because we're not closer than a manhole lid. Yeah. Okay? All right. That was good. My mouth is dry. That means I talked too long. Mm-hmm. <laughs>